So this is our 14th, if you can believe it, webinar in this series. We've been doing this well over a year now. And uh, I want to welcome you to it. I think it's a pretty good topic for quite a few folks, both people who are in the training and performance improvement world, but also uh, if we have folks who are in leadership or management positions, uh, it's also really relevant uh, to, to everyone in that regard. Um, before we get into it a little bit, I want to just remind you, uh, we do have a YouTube channel and you can get to it uh, at performancethinking.tv uh, or sixboxes.tv. And we've got uh, all of our webinars there eventually show up on it. But, you know, we, these are rather long things, an hour or more typically. So there's a bunch of other playlists that are much shorter. We have one on performance consulting one on accomplishment-based coaching, one on sales uh, performance and so forth. And they're much shorter. They're like two, three, four, five minute videos in, in playlists. So uh, there's, there's lots of free information there. Let's put it that way. Uh, we've got more webinars coming up. Uh, we've sort of exchanged. In fact, Peter is here. Uh, we're probably going to do a session maybe first of the year on making strategic plans executable. Uh, next time, and I'll tell you about this in a minute, we're going to do something about HR business partners. Um, uh, our uh, Another colleague of ours is going to join us to talk about learning in the flow and so forth. So there's a bunch of topics coming up. Uh, we're moving right into uh, 2022 pretty soon here. It's kind of hard to believe. Um, next month, and we just made this decision this morning because of shifting around different topics, it's going to be another probably solo session, although my hope is that Barbara Buckland, who did uh, much of this work with me, can join. We're, she's trying to figure it out because November 24th, if you look at your calendar, you realize it's the day before Thanksgiving. So it may be that more people will watch the uh, the recording than the live one. But we're going to talk about some analysis work we've done with HR business partners uh, to identify how they can really help to improve performance uh, over time as they work with managers and, and senior leaders in their organizations. So I think this will be an interesting one. Uh, we'll probably reach out to HR folks and more people in that sector of our uh, interested uh, market, if you will, uh, because I think there's some interesting stuff to be said about it. If you want to sign up for our webinars, uh, you go to our website, performancethinking.com or sixboxes.com. Either will get you there. And there's this little button on the front page, and, and you can click on it. And you can register for whatever the next one is, but you can also check off an item that allows you to register for all future ones, which uh, many of you have, I know. Um, I'm going to do the usual thing that uh, I do every time to try to get a better sense of who you all are. Um, we have a poll here that uh, uh, I want to start, but I want to set it up so that you'll be able to see the results. So there's just a few items on this. What I'd ask you all to do uh, is to check off the one that uh, best fits your um, your role or your description. A training professional who presumably is somebody who does not get outside of skills and knowledge to a large extent, a performance consultant. Might be a process or quality professional. We have a fair number of those in our in our uh, network. Uh, you may have be in other parts of HR or organizational development. Uh, that might be another place that you live or work. And then, of course, maybe there's some business stakeholders and leaders or managers here and other. And I'm not sure what the others are, but uh, this is uh, looking like mostly training and performance improvement professionals, which is fair enough, and a few uh, leaders. So this is this is good to know. I'm going to end this. I think you will be able to see it. Uh, the recording will not, but uh, well, we're still filling some out. So this is good. People are still uh, trying to decide. I'll wait until this is uh, stopped bouncing around, and I think it just about has. So as you can see, we have a lot of uh, training professionals and performance consultants. We have some other uh, folks and uh, some people in various categories. So anyway, thank you for uh, for telling us about that. Uh, I, it always helps me to know a little bit about who's in the room, so to speak. Um, we have a white paper uh, related to this. Some of you, I suspect, have probably uh, seen this white paper before, uh, but you should be able to click on the right of your screen and download it. Uh, it really just covers some of the same ground that we'll be talking about today. It's a few years old, but uh, interestingly, I think the key points have not changed that much. So just at your leisure, you can download that. 
Um, so here's an agenda for uh, today. I want to talk about what we mean by the training box. It's kind of a glib phrase, but I want to talk about what is it and then talk about performance consulting or performance improvement uh, and how do we do it and how do we learn how to do it and uh, how do we engage or partner with our stakeholders. Uh, and uh, so we want to talk about what that takes because it's not a simple matter of being coming certified as a performance improvement professionals. So um, anyway, and hopefully we'll have a few minutes at the end. And there's actually a couple places during the um, during the slides that I'd like to stop and see if you all have comments uh, in the chat box. So what is the training box? Um, you know, I've been using this phrase for a long time, and. Uh, Many of you, because many of you are performance uh, professionals or training and development professionals, know the classic problem of being treated as an order taker, that you have uh, senior leaders or you have stakeholders in your organization, and they come to you sometimes with very specific training requests. They say, we need training. And it's because they've observed some performance gap or some opportunity to improve performance, and training is kind of their natural lever. And so they tend to assume that the need for skills and knowledge is what's driving this. Uh, in, in, by tendency, whether it's our stakeholders or whether it's those of us in the role of training, development, performance improvement, uh, the other aspect of the training box is that we ignore the other behavior influences. We don't think about the fact that, oh, maybe the tools could be better, or maybe the process isn't designed as well as it could be, or are there any consequences for doing the right thing, or how are expectations and feedback arranged, and so forth. <clears throat> so the training box is also about kind of putting on blinders and ignoring the other factors that may well be important, whether instead of training or as in addition to training. Um, and one way to summarize that is it's not taking a systemic approach. As uh, those of you who know about our work recognize, we think of performance as uh, occurring in a system. And it's a system, a whole bunch of interlocking, interconnected variables. And uh, if you're really doing performance improvement, you got to look at those because the last point, which is that's the only way you're going to optimize return on investment. You can spend, for example, an enormous amount on training, developing it, delivering it, creating the platforms for it, uh, bringing people to it, possibly maybe away from their jobs, which is costly, and uh, and not really get the return on that rather substantial investment. And so these are all sort of characteristics of what we mean when we talk about uh, being in the in the training box. Now, the question is, how do we get out of the training box? You know, uh, and and of course, what we would say, and a lot of our colleagues in the, the performance improvement or human performance technology world would say, well, we do performance improvement. We focus not just on training or skills and knowledge, but we focus on performance improvement. And as those of you who know about our work recognize, we have these two simple models that we put together, the performance chain, which is the four components at the top there, and the six boxes model, which is the factors or variables, or what we call behavior influences that affect uh, behavior and, and performance. And so we put them together and we have what we call performance improvement logic. And that logic is a fairly specific, but quite flexible sequence that we go through when we're trying to address any performance opportunity, whether it's coaching an individual or doing a giant global project. We want to be sure we know what's at stake for the organization to start out. We call it business results, could be, uh, could be organizational results if you're not a business, could even be societal results if you think back to the session we did a while back on societal applications. But it's what are we trying to accomplish? Why are we doing this? We want to be sure we understand that and that we are in alignment with our stakeholders about it. Once we do that in our accomplishment-based approach that comes really in the lineage of Tom Gilbert and Joe Harless, we look at what we call work outputs, which are the accomplishments, the countable, valuable products of behavior, uh, which people, teams, or processes contribute to the organization. And uh, that's how we anchor our performance analysis. So we want to be sure we know what the valuable contributions are that uh, we need from people. And once we do that, it becomes a lot easier then to say, OK, well, what behavior do we need? What, what do people have to do to produce those, uh, those work outputs? And that can be done by doing task analysis, by observing successful performers, by doing what's called an exemplary performer analysis, where you actually interview and observe really top 
performers, if there are some, and interview and observe average performers, and then you see what those small things are that the top people do differently and you extract those. But in any case, once you've identified the work outputs of the accomplishments, it's a lot easier to zero in on the needed behavior. And once we've identified those three things, we now are in a position to decide what to measure. We might measure lagging indicator business results, profit, revenue, customer satisfaction, and so forth. We might measure behavior, uh, how people are speaking to customers, how they're you know, uh, managing themselves with respect to safety in a dangerous environment, et cetera. Uh, it's expensive to do sometimes, but it's very powerful for feedback and for diagnosis of what's going on. And then we think uh, the real, uh, uh, underused thing is we might measure work outputs. We might see what the productivity of people are in terms of the countable things that are valuable. So once we know what the measures are, then we look at the behavior influences. All the factors in the six boxes model is how we do it. And we analyze what's working and what's not working. And then we brainstorm improvements. And then we choose the things that we think will likely combine to produce the, the best effect with the greatest return on investment. And then we implement, and as in any agile or ongoing uh, process, ideally we use, we get measurements and we adjust over time and we continuously improve. And of course, in our work, we also, because we, we use this plain English uh, language and these models, um, we engage people uh, in that continuous improvement process. Now, if we do that, if we do performance consulting or performance improvement, um, you know, what we are saying we're going to do is not just training people, but actually accelerating those organizational or business results through the performance of people. And uh, that's a slightly different perspective because we're not focused on our deliverables. We're what my uh, longtime colleague, Bob Redeker, often refers to as a solution neutral. Uh, we want to achieve results and we're trying to do that through people. And the second bullet is a little bit of a a, a, a knock, I suppose, but an awful lot of what goes as performance consulting, what I've observed over the last 40 years, is what I cynically refer to as training on steroids. There's a lot of folks out there, and I'm going to come back to this in a few minutes, but who have been taught in one form or other that um, uh, that performance consulting is being able to speak with business people about their business issues, is being able to demonstrate return on investment, is to be able to work with business acumen, but still basically deliver training solutions. And so we got to go beyond that if we're going to improve performance, because we need to stay, first of all, we need to partner with stakeholders. We can't just do the spray and pray thing, you know, where we, where we train people and hope it makes a difference. If we're going to really improve performance, we've got to partner with the folks who manage, lead, and arrange conditions for the people whose performance we care about uh, so we can actually optimize that. Because if we do that, we can then configure all the things, all the behavior influences needed to maximize return on investment. And what we mean by that is optimizing both productivity and employee engagement. We want productive people, but we also want uh, happy campers. We want people who are excited to come to work. Uh, one of the things that's been influencing a lot uh, of our work recently and how we think about it is Howard Bihar, who was former um, president at Starbucks, and he's a strong component of servant leadership. And when we think about this work, we think about not only helping people to be more productive, but also help them be happy, satisfied humans in their workplace. So this is the promise of performance consulting. This is this is what performance consulting uh, sort of says it can do in organizations. Um, but I will tell you a story, and I'm not going to name any names here, but it, it's, it actually shocked me. I was um, having a series of conversations with people in a very large organization, um, a very large, you know, nationally large, large organization in the learning and development department. And some years ago, uh, quite a few years ago, they had brought in a major provider to provide what was called a certified performance consultant program. So they put several hundred people through a program, which was supposedly turning them into performance consultants. However, as I learned, as I began to hear things from people that seemed a bit odd to me, what I ultimately learned was that those learning and development professionals 
one way or the other had taken from this program that if they identified a need for a so-called non-training intervention, something that didn't involve training or skills and knowledge, that they should decline the opportunity to help stakeholders. That they should say, sorry, that's not in our department. You'll have to handle this yourself. And they repeatedly applied this. They basically refused to help. Now, it is the case, of course, that in many organizations, if uh, somebody in the training department offers to take a look at some of the other things besides skills and knowledge that affect performance, stakeholders can push back. However, that doesn't necessarily suggest we should withdraw from even offering our services, because in doing so, this created further separation. And what I had heard, and this is some years later, is that basically there was this kind of, um, first of all, almost fear to reach out beyond skills and knowledge to say stakeholders, and even a kind of tension where people on the business end of things seemed, felt like they were kind of being refused service. So this is not uh, performance consulting. And you know, they, what they needed to do is somehow find a way to partner with the stakeholders, not to withdraw. So this was to me a horror story because it was not just the thing that we often encounter when we're trying to move out of the training box, but was a kind of an assertive closing the door on the training box and staying inside. So that that got me quite, uh, you know, that probably pushed pushed this particular topic up at our webinar list a little bit sooner. So if you look at our six boxes model, um, you know, it it is a model that evolved from Tom Gilbert's work, which evolved from B.F. Skinner's basic science and covers all of the variables that could possibly affect behavior. And it covers them in these six cells that are la labeled with plain English terms. And they're very interactive. These are not just six lists of things. But if you look at box four, that's skills and knowledge. That is the sort of supposed home of training. And so all of those yellow ones are so-called non-training solutions. And uh, they are things that have significant impact, even if our job is to train people. When we train them, we ought to be setting expectations. We ought to be providing a means of feedback. And ideally, supervisors and managers on the job, when those people return to the job, should also be setting expectations to apply the training that they've learned to and feedback about how they're doing it. Often tools and resources, things like process design, software, and so forth, gets in the way of performance. And not only that, but as performance improvement people, sometimes we can provide tools in the form of things like job aids or online support systems, which can actually accelerate performance well beyond just the skills and knowledge factor. Consequences and incentives. That's what the good stuff is that happens when you do what you're asked to do. And if that's missing or not taken into account, we could have a problem. And it's quite conceivable that no amount of training could ever fix that problem until we unearth the issue of uh, consequences working against us. If we select and assign the wrong people, uh, you know, then uh, <laughs> that's not going to help. But the flip side to that is if we select and assign great people, but put them in an environment where expectations and feedback are not working, where the tools and resources are either not available or ineffective, and where there's no real consequences or incentives for doing the right thing, we're going to burn those people out. So box five will not be effective even if we do a good job with it. And finally, motives and preferences. If we don't line up with the values that the organization has, but also hire people and communicate to people about the values we have here, what we care about, et cetera, then we will have some misalignments. So so-called non-training solutions, you know, if you decide you're not going to deal with them at all and you're just going to deal with skills and knowledge, it's not a shock that at some point, uh, your business stakeholders would be skeptical about what you as a training and development professional can offer. Because at least my experience is, and I think most people will recognize, that you can roll out the best training in the world. But if those other variables aren't working in alignment, then the training is not going to pay, pay off. Moreover, you can very often do things like introduce new expectations, provide more feedback, and give people good job aids. You might not even have to explicitly do training at all. So it's very problematic to be looking at these things separate from one another. Now, what I would argue is that, and this is what it says in the white paper too, is that to get out of the training box, really there's two parts. The first part is to learn to do performance improvement. 
And there are different ways to do that. You can you can go through our performance uh, thinking practitioner program, which is a very plain English, powerful, highly flexible way to, to approach performance. You might be lucky to, enough to have gone through programs that evolved from Joe Harless's work. There's various ways uh, you can, but the point is you got to learn how to do this work beyond skills and knowledge. That turns out to in some cases be kind of the easy part because once you do that, you got to engage your stakeholders as partners in this. Because if you can't do it, you're not going to be able to control those other variables or have influence. And that, in my opinion, is typically the hardest part. And it's not even so much that, that it's hard. It's just that it takes time. Because if, particularly if you're in an organization or in a function that has been defined as training <coughs> for some period of time, this is what people expect to get from you. And so there's a whole shift that has to happen for that second thing to happen. So let's talk a little bit about each of these. First about learning to do performance improvement. What is that about? Well, one of the things is master and apply the tools, you know, and the logic. And as I said, we have a methodology and I sort of summarized it in those slides that showed the graphics. Uh, but, you know, master this process, this, this analysis and design and configuration of solutions process. And uh, that's a big deal. But uh, you want to be rigorous. One of the things in our programs is that uh, sometimes I feel like I'm being a nitpicker because in defining the elements of performance, we, we want to get precise. Just like, you know, you, if you're playing the, a musical instrument, you want to play the notes right. But on the other hand, we want to get to the point where we're rigorous but not rigid. Because one of the beauties about um, it, certainly performance thinking, our approach to performance improvement, is that once you get some fluency with it, uh, you can be sort of flexible. You can apply the logic, but you can apply it to different levels of depth. For certification, we sort of insist on, you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's. But if you present yourself to your clients as rigid, it's probably not going to be helpful. And also, if you're going to approach problems, you need to be willing to and able to be agile as you as you do so. Um, and as you as you have more and more applications, uh, as you build fluency, essentially, and breadth when you do maybe things related, let's say, to roles, things like onboarding or training, things related maybe to, to process improvement or implementation, maybe change management related things, maybe cultural values things. As you do different kinds of applications of this core performance improvement methodology, you'll get more flexible. You'll get more easily able to do this work so that it isn't, uh, it, it, it moves more quickly. You know where you can flex and where you can't and so forth. Now, one of the beauties, in my opinion, of working in an organization uh, where there's others, particularly if you have a shared language as, as we teach, is that you've got other folks to work with. You've got your stakeholders, if you can engage them, and you've got your performance improvement colleagues. And one of the big deals from my perspective is to build a community of practice because, I mean, whatever it is, almost 50 years later, I've been doing performance improvement. I'm still learning from almost every project that I coach or have anything to do with. And what I find is we all have things to contribute to this if we're given a framework for doing it. Um, and in the process, uh, instead of becoming rigid and you know sort of uh, narrow, we become flexible and hopefully friendly and hopefully forthcoming and confident. And the confident part I think is important because uh, you know, I often tell the story that probably up until 10 years ago, I mean, I've done hundreds of different kinds of projects in my career, but when I would enter into a new industry, or for example, when I first moved from sales performance into customer service, or first got involved in, you know, billing and, uh, you know, factory maintenance, various, I was always terrified that it wouldn't work. <laughs> and uh, I thought, oh my gosh, you know, what's gonna happen? But what I found was, if you apply the logic, if you apply the tools, it works. And when you get to the point where you're confident like that, you can move into a situation where you don't really know much to start with, but you ask the right questions and you can do an analysis which is illuminating and then engage your stakeholders in a conversation about how we can improve conditions to optimize performance. So in the end, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to become confident people who aren't just viewed as somebody who knows some, has some subject matter expertise, but actually who has a specialized expertise, which is how do you analyze performance? How do you pull it apart so you understand what you're looking at? And how do you then configure solutions to improve it? So that's kind of one way to think about 
uh, you know, learning to do it. And let me ch let me stop for a moment. Uh, there's a bunch of you who have made comments in the chat box. So I know you know how to use it. I wonder if anybody has any comments or questions about that part of it, the sort of the learning to be the performance consultant part. And if so, please feel free to use the chat box. Any comments from me? I see a bunch of experienced folks in this group. Um, comments, observations? Are we still alive? Can you guys hear me? Hmm. Anyone? Anyone have some comments? Yes, Alice is alive. Thank you. Difficult to convince trainers of the importance of consulting. Many want to just, well, that's fair enough, Ben. And some people probably aren't suited uh, to be performance consultants, and that's fair enough. But uh, that's a good point. Providing evidence. Yeah, Lauren, that's a really good point about providing evidence. One of the things we actually did a, um, a webinar quite a long time ago with Bill Blunt, who is a longtime colleague of ours. And he talked about, he's retired now, but he talked about when he brought performance improvement into his organization, how it was a viral process, basically. How, um, how uh, working with a series of different stakeholders in a series of different projects, some of which they said, please just stay with the training, sometimes they didn't. But when they would begin to produce results, that got around. And so that's a little bit of the evidence that you're talking about. Um, what level of experience is required, John? I think um, what I would say about this, you know, in our program, and I really only know uh, our performance uh, thinking uh, practitioner program, I've been teaching it for decades now, but what I find is that people, um, uh, you need to be personable, <laughs> you need to be someone analytical, um, and when you first start out your first projects, like anything else, you may, you know, it may be challenging, which is why we, in our program, we actually coach people through their first successful project. But I would say the level of expertise partly is the skill set and the tools, and that's why we make our tools simple, but it's partly just experience, just starting to work with them, uh, you know, and don't take on a Curing World for Hunger project in the beginning, but begin to apply it. And in your environment, that will, that will get you to what you need. Um, yeah, Peter's comment is great. He says you, you start by painting by numbers and as you become more fluent, you know, you have a real conversation. That's fair enough. Um, yes, breaking people away from the status quo for sure. Although one of the things, uh, uh, one of the things that I know is that um, is that when when business if you can speak to business people in plain english and if you use something like our performance chain model this makes sense to them and so if you say we want a partner to try to improve the contributions that your people make and we know that we can perhaps provide some skills and knowledge if that's relevant but there's probably some other stuff we need to do to really get the payoff if we can engage them which is the second thing i want to talk about after this then um you can begin to move people along, but it doesn't happen instantly for sure. Getting clients away from solution mode. Yeah, that's a good point, Don. Uh, this whole thing about being solution neutral. We all show up, you know, with, uh, with what we think our solutions are. And uh, so, you know, what, what one of my mentors, and I think also for you, Don, uh, Joe Harless, he used to say when people would come to him, and they'd say, can you give us training? You know, and Joe would say, uh, well, uh, I, I can help you. And, uh, you know, can I talk to a few of your people? And so he would go do some investigating, some analysis. And he might or might not come back with thinking that skills and knowledge are part of the answer. And, uh, but he, and he might even, he used to talk about training and drag, where the, where the a job aid would really do it. But if you had a session to introduce the job aid, that looked like training and so it kept the stakeholders happy. There's a lot of tricks like that. But you're right, getting people away from sort of knee-jerk solution mode. And I would say, Don, not just our, our clients, but I would say us. 
I would say we professionals can easily move into that, you know, knee-jerk solution mode. That's why we have a brainstorming component of our, of in the way we do stuff. Uh, it's a design thing. Um, so Alice's comment, talk about systems thinking and the pivotal change maker. Absolutely, it's important to have those change makers. So those are some really good comments. So let's keep going on this. Um, thank you for that. For, thank you for making those thoughts in the chat box. Um, to me, the second part, and really it's what's fascinating is that many of your comments in the chat box are really about this part. Um, because I think that is the challenge. That's the part that really takes time. And um, yeah, Ian's got a good comment there too. Yeah, ch check out the chat box, everybody. Be sure you're reading each other's comments. There's some good stuff in there. So one of the things about it is sometimes, almost guaranteed, they will reject you in some way. They come to you and say, we need training. And you maybe do some analysis and you say, well, there's some other stuff here that not only do you probably need, but if we do training, maybe we need to engage in setting new expectations. And they may well say, as is often the case, thank you very much. We'll handle that, you know, uh, uh, you know, just do the training part. And so this is a request implicitly for your persistence and to continue to be friendly. One of Bill Blunt's uh, stories, and he's told it in different ways over the years, is how he would go in, do some analysis, come back to stakeholders and say, you know, I think there's some issues around your tools and there's some conflicting expectations in addition to maybe a skills and knowledge thing. And they'd say, oh, thank you very much. Just handle the training. And then on occasion, the uh, stakeholders would come back and say, you know, I think you had a point there. Can you come back and we can talk about this? Because what we're trying to do is to get people to engage with us in the conversation about what might be helpful. Um, in our work, we find plain English helps a lot. Um, you know, we try to avoid jargon. That's That's been really a key differentiator for performance thinking that we, as we say, we have these two simple pictures and 21 plain English words. What I've noticed is that I can sit down with a business person and I can, I can draw literally on the whiteboard or on a screen or uh, I've done it on napkins before, our models and sort of step through how we think about it and say, does this make sense to you? And if it's plain English and we're not sort of laying some techno jargon on them, they often are willing to listen. Um, another one, and, and this is kind of related to what a couple of your comments were in the chat box, I think. We wanna ask lots of questions. We wanna show that we're really interested in learning about their stuff. We wanna also, uh, maybe make a few comments that are insightful. I was speaking with a very senior a quality a guy from uh, a big company just yesterday, and we were having this great conversation. And what I recognized was I would say some things coming from the perspective of our performance thinking models. And he would say, yeah, that's absolutely true. And so if you can, if you can make a connection with those people around the issues that concern them, and I don't mean trying to talk like an like you have an MBA. I mean, in very practical terms, like what do you, what do you people need to produce to be successful? You know, what's at stake for your organization? You know, et cetera. How is expectations working for you? Do you guys provide a lot of feedback? Those kinds of conversations are pretty straightforward. And if you ask a lot of them without being a bullying question asker, people will get engaged in that conversation. Um, Again, I keep coming back to this theme, but explaining your work in ways that are simple. And this is why, this is really what led ultimately to our development of our performance thinking models, the performance chain, the six boxes model, which evolved from Tom Gilbert and Joe Harless's work, but we user tested language for the elements of them and found that people didn't make mistakes if you use the language. And so it you can explain stuff to people pretty simply. Um, Another thing, and this is a little bit further down the line, but if you have some successes, if you do some projects for people, if you're inside an organization, for example, uh, and um, and you're, you know, there's some success, you improved first call resolution in the call center, or you improved cycle time, or you got, um, you know, you got people responding more and closing more deals, you, you uh, improve the quality and coming off the line, whatever it was. Um, and people have some results that they can share. 
one of the things we want to do is encourage those stakeholders who, who were willing to partner with us and saw results to share it with their peers. Don't just come to us and like give us little awards and recognitions and meetings of our training and development performance consulting group. Go to your colleagues and say, hey, I was working with those guys and this made a difference. That's where you begin to get word of mouth and it can be very helpful. Um, and I think, again, it's about establishing our reputation. One of my sort of stupid jokes is that, um, you know, if you had, uh, if the door of your department said job aids on it, people might come to you for job aids, but it says training or it says training and development or learning and development. And so people tend to come with thinking, you know, we offer that solution. But um, if you can over time, and I always say it might take something like 18 months for a group to really start to shift their stakeholders to the point where they are willing to engage in this way. But if you can shift to the point where people recognize that you have a skill set, which is about asking smart questions and helping them unpack the issues that they have with their with performance, and then partner with them for recommendations that actually pay off, that's the reputation you want. You want people to say, hey, you should go talk to those guys because they can probably help you in this situation. Now, this doesn't answer all the questions about how to, but I think it's some of the critical elements. So we're actually pretty close to the end of what I have to say. What I would like to do is to open up the chat box again and see what you guys have to say about any of this as a continuing conversation. I'm just looking at Ian's comment in the chat box. Um, very nice comment, Ian. Yeah, it's, you know, you're trying to make it easily digestible for people. One of the implications of your use of the word fluency in your comment too, Ian, is, you know, as we get so we're comfortable talking about these things and we have a simple language that we can use in conversations with, with our stakeholders and maybe we, we've identified early on what they use in their vocabulary about business results and we're beginning to understand the performance of their people. We can get a lot more fluent in our conversational work with them. We can, we, can, we can move into this sort of relationship that's much more like colleagues trying to solve a problem. Uh, I'm looking at Marty's comment. Um, yes, Marty's got a good point. And I, if, for example, in my work, he says, you may find a focus on a limited number of businesses, et cetera. One of the things in my uh, experience was uh, I really, without planning it wound up in sales performance work in the early 80s. And one of the beauties about sales uh, people is they're very pragmatic and they're very connected to results. And so I've, I found uh, that I was able to work with VPs of sales, product, uh, you know, product marketing VPs or managers, um, people involved in that world. And they sort of got it. They understood they were trying to hit milestones in the sales process. They understood uh, the pragmatics of, you know, producing results. And so I did, I did that work almost exclusively for probably a decade and then moved into customer service and then moved into a whole lot of other areas over the years. But I think your point is, is well taken, Marty, that if you learn about a particular area of performance, you can at least go in there with greater confidence. Um, as my, as I said earlier, uh, I used to be afraid that when I moved into some new area of performance, it wouldn't work. But by that time, I'd become confident enough with the use of our models and language. So that was my area of fluency. I didn't come in saying, I know about sales performance. I said, I know about performance and I can help you sort this out. Yeah, it is, it is really good advice. Any other comments or questions about this work? And I, I'm curious, I, I'd be interested to hear if some of you have been held in the training box by your stakeholders or clients and maybe found found ways out or around that if anybody has any comments about that no more chat box stuff huh well i think i might let's see if who else is here I have a bunch of people i know and some people i don't know so well but, um, you know, we can, uh, we certainly don't have to continue this any, any longer than necessary. I think the, the key notion is that there really are these two things. And one is to learn the skill set yourself. Um, and the other is to enable 
you know, to figure out how to partner with stakeholders. Um, this is just sort of a summary slide, really. Um, oh, that's a very good point, uh, Dale. Human performance technology tends to die rather than thrive if it's housed within training and development. One of the things, though, and we didn't mention this, probably worth worth identifying. I've known a fair number of organizations, places like, well, actually, in two biotech companies and some other sales organizations and some places where they've changed the name of their department from training and development to something like learning and performance or performance development. And although that's not enough to do, if you follow up by saying, and we, here's our menu, we do training design delivery for sure, but we also do performance analysis, job aids, we can help you set up you know, different management systems, we can help improve and execute processes. We've got a list that's longer than just training. What I've found is that some of the training and development departments and organizations and companies have been able to pivot and over a period of time come to be recognized in a different way. I mean, for example, at Amgen, um, operations, learning and performance, which has something like 250 uh, certified performance thinking practitioners, they're viewed as a, as a business advantage by their senior leaders, but it took them quite a while to get there. Um, you know, Ben, your comment about convincing leaders up the chain to think outside the training box is challenging. Um, what, what I think we've seen uh, is that if you can, you know, somebody mentioned change agents earlier. I think it was, uh, I think it was Alice. But one of the things is if you can find uh, internal stakeholders or clients who are interested, who say, hmm, you know, this is worth having a conversation about, then glom on to those people and really try to partner with them because not everybody is going to be receptive. Um, oh, that's a very good point, Ian. Um, you know, one of, I, and I didn't say that, I'm glad it's not quite responding to exactly what you said, but Ian says he's trying to push into the training box. And I think that's a really good point. You know, one of the things that we've done is uh, my sort of first recommendation to training professionals is almost a stealth move. If you begin to list your training objectives, instead of behaviors or skills and knowledge, you say at the end of this training, the trainees will be able to produce decisions, relationships, documents, uh, forward movement, milestones in the sales process, whatever it is. In other words, accomplishments or outputs. If you just begin in your training programs to define the objectives of those training programs as accomplishments, that can take you a long way. First of all, it's a subtle change in language. And people might not even notice that you're saying at the end of this training program, people will be able to produce and then you name a thing. If they do, you can have an interesting conversation about it. But the beauty about it is, is if those are outputs or accomplishments that are actually needed on the job, then, um, then you can also engage, potentially at least, you can more easily engage those responsible for the job or work environment to arrange conditions around tools and resources, around new expectations, around feedback. So that's one way to move into the training box and then change it and say, we should be accomplishment based here. And if we are, it will help us connect up with the business more directly. Um, Don, I'm looking at your comment. We would believe they need training. Yeah. So that's great. That's a great comment, Don. You know, you can sort of lead them from where they are with some questions so you, everybody can see what, what Don wrote, but ask them, ask them what leads them to believe they need training. And you can dig into that a bit. And, you know, one way to think about that too sometimes is part of the transition might be training plus. And that's not too far from Joe Harless's thing about disguising jo a job aid introduction as a training event. Um, you know, maybe you provide training and they're willing to spend the money on it and that's the way it goes. But then you argue for the return on investment. You say, look, you guys are taking your people off the job or they're expecting to spend time in self-study. Uh, and so we'll do the training for you. But if you want this to pay off, could we have a conversation about how to be sure you get transfer of training onto the job? And that's where you can start talking about some of those other things 
that Don's suggesting, like what leads you to believe they need training? Well, they're having a hard time with the software. Well, maybe the software design could be improved or whatever. I mean, just, that's just a maybe silly example, but um, uh, sometimes those conversations where you start where they are, that's a, that's a really good suggestion. Looking at John O'Connor. Informal, a mentoring program, there you go. So one of the things that often happens, that's a great story, John, where uh, the people who see this recording aren't gonna be able to see the uh, chat box, unfortunately, but uh, John says he, uh, he had a senior manager uh, that wanted him to create training because the newer production trainers didn't have the people people's older training, the people older training once learned. Anyway, um, he did an analysis and find, found out that uh, during downcycle, mentors from the training group uh, were let go, and uh, and and nobody took on those responsibilities. So instead of creating training, they developed a mentoring program. Is the point? So a lot of times you can start out with a thing, and it turns into something else. Um, yeah, Dale, what are people not doing that you want them to do? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, and there's the old. Of course, there's the old. Um, uh, Bob Mager thing, and I forget how it was originally said, May, Pipe and Mager, but you know, the old thing about could they do it if you put a gun to their head? You know, is it a motivational issue or is it a skills and knowledge issue? But again, you can train people until, you know, everyone is blue in the face. But if you don't also have conditions to support that training, then uh, you're going to have a problem. That is, you're not going to have the payoff you expect. People skills, exactly. Yeah. Well, this is this is uh, good stuff. I think I'm going to try to save the chat box here uh, and include it when we post this webinar. Uh, I have not yet figured out how to uh, record with Webinar Jam the chat box, and that's where all the action is here today. Um, I appreciate all of your comments. This is a good uh, experienced group of folks we have here. And I, I know a lot of you, some of you, I know your names, but I don't know anybody, I don't know everybody. So getting back just to the points on this last slide, uh, this notion that we have a special expertise, that what we're good at is figuring out, uh, you know, what needs to be done. And so we aren't, we don't just produce deliverables, we actually do analysis and design. And as long as we can do that, in a reasonably timely and effective fashion. And if we bring insights to people that they didn't know about, then that often is perceived as valuable. Um, I've actually worked with training and development teams who decided to create a menu of services that, as I was saying earlier, extended beyond training. It's like, oh, you do that too? And so there's, there's that. There's a certain amount of marketing that happens if you're doing it as an organization. Um, and I really do think there's a matter of patience here. Um, um, you know, Bill Blunt in his webinar that you can see on our YouTube channel talk about viral change. And it took some time at that organization to go from just a couple people doing this performance improvement, performance thinking thing, beginning to produce some results with people, beginning to show people that there are more things to think about, over time demonstrating value, capturing the attention of a fairly senior guy, a VP, um, having him become an advocate, et cetera. This is an ongoing process. And I think if you're an inside of a company, it probably does take longer to do that than it does to uh, become a performance consultant. Although, you know, what we encourage people to do in, in our practitioner program is to apply the models and the la logic any place you can, not just formal projects, but even informal, small performance issues with people in your team or opportunities to improve or development opportunities. Um, yeah, Marty, exactly. Start with the uh, business results and be sure people know about that. Um, the next, uh, we, we haven't, Carly, good question. This is uh, our own uh, being having too many things to do uh, about the next practitioner program. We've got one coming up starting in July, uh, or excuse me, January 11th. Uh, I think we'll probably have another one around March, but that is a, a good uh, kick in the rear for me to get those dates 
uh, up there, and I apologize for not having. We we want to try to have uh, two two you know two sets of dates on there, and we've just been lagging some of the time. Ned, are you in uh, are you in Sweden? Um, Yeah, really, sex. Ed. That's right, Ned. Very good. Um, the comment about we want sex education or sex training. Um, is it knowledge based and so forth? Um, anyway, I think uh, you know. I think that's kind of a summary. I want to tell you, you know, for two years now we've been unable to have our wonderful summer institute because of COVID. We had to cancel it the year before last, and then we thought we were going to do this last June, and we had to cancel it, and then we thought we were going to be able to do it this last September, and then we had to cancel it. We've got dates next June. It is a wonderful experience. It would be the 11th annual one. It's a it's it's an opportunity to get together with other practitioners and learn a bunch at a place. So put those dates in your calendar just in case there's any chance you can make it. Um, and there's lots more information you can get as well. Um, you know, our, our resource library at performancethinking.com or sixboxes.com has a bunch of articles in it, a bunch of white papers on different topics like process improvement, sales performance, leadership and management. Uh, our YouTube channel, which is just performancethinking.tv, not only has these webinars at it, but also has a bunch of little bits as well um, that are worth looking at. And the LinkedIn group is the thing which its default becomes just letting people know when our next programs are. But my experience is if people uh, raise a question or raise an issue in that group, uh, sometimes there's some pretty interesting answers because you've got, there's a lot of people that participate in that. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, three jokes. Okay, thank you everybody. I think we're probably done unless there's any last comments from people. I don't wanna take more of your time than needed, but this is, uh, had some good chat box discussion and I appreciate it. And, and uh, next time we're gonna talk about HR business partners. So uh, I hope you'll have that on your calendar. And frankly, if you've got colleagues in the human resources department or HR business partners, uh, I would love to uh, have them appear because, and of course we'll have the recording so we can always share that with them later. But we've, done, we've, we've thought for a long time uh, that HR business partners would, were potentially an enormous a source of influence around performance in organizations. A lot of times they function sort of transactionally, but you know, especially senior HR business partners often are kind of management consultants. And so we have sort of modularized some of our material in ways that we think can help benefit them. And in any case, it's quite interesting to look at the performance of them. We've done some analysis on that. So anyway, thank you everybody. Appreciate your time. Uh, this will be, uh, uh, posted in about 36 hours. And um, so you can share it with friends if you want to or watch it again. So thanks so much. Gonna end now.